Good evening. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this evening's panel presentation. Uh, I am David Mitchell. I am one of the co-directors of the uh, Michael A. Middleton Center for Race, Citizenship, and Justice. And you will be hearing from the other co-director, Dr. Stephanie Shonikin, who will be moderating the panel this evening after Dr. Jones's presentation. The Middleton Center, for many who do not know, uh, who also may be first-time participants, was conceived in the midst of social unrest and activism on our campus and was born following the protests after the killing of George Floyd. The mission and purpose of the center is to foster cross-disciplinary research on, apply the research related to, and elevate the local, state, regional, and national conversation around three pillars of race, citizenship, and justice. And to do this in a way that is inclusive of the larger community. Tonight's program accomplishes all of those goals and we are incredibly proud of that fact. We are proud to be co-sponsoring this with campus partners and community partners, the College of Education and Human Development, Social Studies Education and the Bridge, as well as our community partner, Race Matters Friends. As Mizzou Giving Day is underway, uh, I would like to encourage you all to assist us in our efforts to continue to bring critically engaging conversations, to highlight the work of renowned scholars, and to offer programs that contribute positively to the dialogue on race, citizenship, and justice. I just felt like a KBIA NPR announcement right then. But we do need uh, your support for us to keep, and to keep engaging in this, quite frankly. Uh, and so now I'm going to introduce to you the president of Race Matters Friends, who has the honor to introduce our guest of this evening. Tracy Wilson Kleekamp holds a master's in social studies education and is presently fourth year doctoral student at the MU College of Education and Human Development. She's a graduate of California State University, Long Beach with a bachelor of arts degree in journalism, public relations. Uh, for over 20 years, she has been a neighborhood and community activist advocating for community oriented policing, public parks, transparent and responsive local government, and sustainable urban planning. In recent years, she has focused her activism as president of the group Race Matters Friends, a local nonprofit organization focused on social justice advocacy. Finally, in her spare time, she's an avid genealogist and critical family historian who explores local, state, and national historical repositories to help family historians discover more about their African-American heritage. And she is currently featured on the Missouri State Archives website, African American Genealogy, putting together the pieces of your past, a five part series with Tracy Wilson Kleekamp. And so I give you Tracy Wilson Kleekamp, our next speaker. Thank you all for joining us this evening once again. Thank you very much for that. And I'm just going to hold up my book because I'm so excited. Um, I, we have a book club, and our biggest dream was to have Dr. Jones be a book talk guest. So all my bookworms are like, yay, 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 they're super happy. Um, uh, like everyone, um, we are dependent on donations, but um, uh, at racemattersfriends.com, you can see more about the work that we do in the community. Um, I'm really excited to have you, Dr. Jones. I'm going to tell you a bit about her. There's actually a, not, a lot to know. Professor Martha S. Jones is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, Professor of History, and a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at the John Hopkins University. She's a legal and cultural historian whose work examines how Black Americans have shaped the story of American history. Professor Jones is the author of Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equity for All, which is published in 2020. It was selected as one of Time Magazine's 100 Must Read Books for 2020. Her 2018 book, Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America, in 2018 was the winner of the Organization of American Historians Liberty Legacy Award, Best Book in Civil Rights History. Um, the American Historical Association Littleton Griswold Prize, the best book in American legal history, the American Society for Legal History, John Reed Philip Reed Book Award, best book in Anglo-American legal history, and the Baltimore City Historical Society Scholars Honor for 2020. Professor Jones is also the author of All Bound Up Together, The Woman Question in African-American Public Culture, 1830 to 1900, which was published in 2007. 
and a co-editor of Toward an Ed Intellectual History of Black Women by the University of North Carolina Press in 2015, together with many articles and essays. If you wanna read what she's thinking more recently, you can catch her columns in the New York Times. Professor Jones is a public historian writing for broader audiences at the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, USA Today, Public Books, Talking Points Memo, Political, The Talk Chronicle of Higher Education in Time. She is an exhibition curator for Reframing the Color Line and Proclaiming Emancipation at the Women William L. Clements Library and an expert, I'm sorry, and an expert consultant for museum, film, and video productions with the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery the Charles Wright Museum of African American History, PBS American Experience, the Southern Poverty Law, Netflix, and art um, in France. Dr. Jones holds a PhD in history from Columbia University and a JD from the CUNY School of Law, which bestowed upon her the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa in 2019. Prior to her academic career, she was a public interest litigator in New York recognized for her work as a Charles H. Revson Fellow on the future of the city of New York at Columbia University. Professor Jones is a media and past president of the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians, and today serves on the boards of the Society of American Historians, the National Women's History Museum, U.S. Capitol Historical Society, the John Hopkins University Press, the Journal of African American History, and Slavery and Abolition. That's a lot of good stuff to know. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, we have a couple of panelists, and I think Dr. Shanikin is going to uh, move us along a little further. So, Dr. Jones, you're up, and then I'll introduce our panelists after you speak. Thank you. Super. Um, well, thank you all um, so much for having me, for coming out this um, evening. Um, there are many people to thank, um, the Middleton Center, the College of Education, Race Matters Friends, um, everyone who has worked behind the scenes and will work in front of the Zoom tonight um, to really ensure that we have a deep and um, important conversation. And I'm really honored. Um, I wanna say a very special thank you to my friend and colleague, Tracy wilson Kleekamp. Um, we have been plotting this for a long time, Tracy, and so um, I'm just thrilled to be here and to be in fellowship with you always. So thank you um, very much. Um, I'm going to talk tonight um, a bit from uh, the book Vanguard um, that folks have mentioned, um, and I hope it will be a, a, a launching point for um, comments that I know um, that are to come and for um, your comments and questions. Um, this is a book I've lived with now for um, a couple of years. And um, so um, it's a really um, rewarding and um, really uh, generative for me um, to do some thinking um, after the book is in the world um, and to understand better how it can and how it might continue to do um, good work in our world, work that we need. Um, Many of you likely know that in 2020, we marked uh, 100 years of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution, uh, the so-called women's suffrage amend, uh, amendment. Um, and I was somebody who um, frankly, uh, didn't engage in the sorts of celebrations that characterized that year. Um, Importantly, um, there were laser light shows and um, parades and um, women jumping out of airplanes. There was a lot of hoopla around the marking the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Um, and still, I was someone um, after working on Vanguard that really couldn't bring a spirit of celebration um, to the occasion. Um, when we appreciate uh, what an open secret Black women's disenfranchisement was in 1920. Um, the facts of the 19th Amendment for me fit only awkwardly with um, those celebrations. It was true in 1920 that members of Congress who promulgated the 19th Amendment, state lawmakers who ratified it and the suffragists um, who promoted it 
um, all of them understood that nothing in the terms of the amendment would prohibit individual states from strategically using Jim Crow laws, um, deliberately permitting violence and intimidation um, to keep black women um, from the polls, even after the federal amendment. Um, not unlike our own time, it was true in 1920 that voting rights and the expansion of voting rights for some went hand in hand with voter suppression um, of others. Um, so uh, what I wanna do um, to focus our conversation tonight is to uh, take on, I think, what are two myths that uh, surround the 19th Amendment. And probably you've heard one, if not both of them, repeated. Um, the first myth goes something like the 19th Amendment um, won American women the right to vote. Um, you might even hear folks say that the 19th Amendment guaranteed American women the right to vote. And so we'll talk about that. Not quite, right? Um, but there's a second myth that almost runs counter to the first, and that is that, um, that in the wake of the 19th Amendment, no Black American women gained the right to vote, um, that racism kept Black women from the polls. Not exactly correct either. Um, so I think part of my work um, has been to um, confront those myths um, and to offer up um, a long history of black women's political activism and to um, flesh out their relationship to the 19th amendment um, over time. I'll take just a moment to remind you what the amendment says. The good news is it's a short one. And so I can read it to you. Um, uh, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Um, and maybe already just in the plain language of the amendment, you can imagine um, where the loopholes may have been. Um, so what did the amendment mean for American women? Well, it surely meant that laws that had and continued to reserve the ballot for men violated the constitution. Um, those laws were no longer enforceable um, in any of the states. And still the 19th amendment did not guarantee any woman the right to vote. And in fact, laws, state laws still kept many American women from the polls based upon age, based upon citizenship, residency, mental competence. Um, it was still true in 1920 that an American woman who married a non-citizen was denaturalized and lost her right to vote. So in the fall of 1920, when American women begin to show up and look to register to vote, they still confront many hurdles. Sex is just no longer one of them. Now, there is one additional barrier, of course, and the one that will occupy much of our conversation tonight, um, one barrier that also persisted after the federal amendment, and that was racism. Um, it was true that 50 years before the 19th Amendment in 1870, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution had expressly forbid states from denying the vote because of race. But by 1920, we know that lawmakers in the American South and West had set in place hurdles that while neutral about race on their face, were designed to have the net effect of disenfranchising African-American men. Poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses. By 1920, were effectively keeping many, many black men from casting ballots. That had been true since the 1890s. That along with unchecked intimidation, the threat of lynching, in essence had sealed the deal for many black men. Local voting officials had effectively constructed a color line um, even as they rarely invoked race in the formal terms of law. So did American women win the right to vote in 1920? Not all women. African-American women in too many states became mere equals to their fathers and their husbands. State laws now disenfranchise them 
in an end run around the 15th and the 19th Amendments. As we recover registration numbers, um, they reflect the effects of those discriminatory laws. And it was true that while Black women presented themselves to voting officials in important numbers in the fall of 1920, many, many of them found that the books were in essence um, closed. And still, the first waves of Black women voters had been unleashed years before um, in individual states that had already made women suffrage the law. In California, starting in 1911, Illinois in 1913, New York in 1917, Black women were already experienced voters by 1920, and even more managed to register and cast ballots that fall in the wake of the 19th Amendment. Um, not all women. So how do Black women manage and, and navigate um, this fraught scene um, in the fall of 1920? I'll offer just a couple of examples. Um, one of them comes from St. Louis in Missouri, um, where Black women are organized under the auspices of the YWCA in the Phyllis Wheatley branch, um, named for the 18th century um, poet. Uh, there, um, Black women run a suffrage school um, and they prepare one another for their chance to register, for their chance to cast ballots. They teach one another how to pay a poll tax, how to pass a literacy test. They even strategize with one another about how to confront uh, begrudging registration officials. Um, and Black women turn out and register. Um, we rely on newspaper reports um, for those numbers. Um, and in St. Louis, what the papers tell us is that that season, um, the fall of 1920, nearly all women in St. Louis register and vote, black and white. But maybe they don't register for quite the same reasons. Um, it was true for all women, um, registering and voting in the fall of 1920 was a fulfillment of the promise of the 19th Amendment. It was the pinnacle of the long struggle to win that amendment. Um, it marked the entry of American women um, into the body politic um, in an unprecedented way. Um, but for Black women, there was more to it in the fall of 1920 in a city like St. Louis. In that city, um, what Black women knew was that um, starting in 1916, city officials had been using voter referenda to set in place a draconian housing segregation regime. Um, and so when Black women register and vote, they are, yes, realizing that promise and that possibility of women's political empowerment. And um, on the um, on the reins of that problem, Jim Crow, as it is taking hold and taking shape, new shape in a city like St. Louis. Black women are just um, as um, committed, even in this um, remarkable moment um, of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to using the vote um, to further civil rights interests um, as much as women's rights interests. My other example uh, comes from the city of Daytona in Florida. And uh, Daytona is home um, to the formidable Mary McLeod Bethune, um, an educator, uh, club movement leader, uh, suffragist, who spends much of 1920 traveling the state of Florida, um, not unlike the women in St. Louis, um, encouraging Black women to register and to prepare themselves to cast ballots in the fall of 1920. Um, Mrs. Bethune is among those Black voting rights activists in Florida in 1920 who will be subjected to um, brutal suppression and outright violence, organized violence, um, spearheaded by the Ku Klux Klan in 1920. Um, she will come home to Daytona for election day, um, but on the eve of election day in 1920, um, Klansmen will gather in downtown Daytona, um, full regalia, horseback, 
they'll burn a cross in the river, um, and then they will march to the grounds of Mrs. Bethune's girls' school there, uh, what is today Bethune-Cookman University, um, in an effort to intimidate her, um, intimidate her faculty, and generally intimidate the Black women of Daytona in an effort to keep them from the polls. The Klan isn't successful in 1920, and Black women in Daytona will actually turn out en masse to vote. The lines will be long, they will be slow, but they will cast their ballots. They take advantage of a modest safety in numbers. But by 1922, um, the violence in Florida um, has been persistent. Um, it is unchecked. Nothing in the 19th Amendment interferes with that brand of voter suppression. And even a profoundly courageous figure like Mrs. Bethune will step away from advocating um, for voting rights in Florida. Um, I hope we'll get a chance to talk some about what she does next. So when Black women look around um, the political landscape um, in the fall of 1920, um, when the dust settles on election day, um, they discern a profoundly uneven landscape. Um, there are places where they are able to vote, cast ballots, um, where they are even beginning to be um, influencers, I guess that's a 21st century term, um, in party politics. Um, and of course, there are too many places in which they have been kept from the polls um, altogether. Part of the charge for strategizing about what comes next falls to Hallie Quinn Brown, who in 1920 is the president of the National Council, uh, uh, thank you, um, uh, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Um, Hallie Quinn Brown is from Ohio. Um, she is a church activist, a longtime suffragist, um, and has really been responsible for transforming the NACWC into, um, in part, a suffrage association for upwards of 100,000 um, Black women across the country. Brown quickly sets her sights now in the wake of the disappointments of the 19th Amendment. She sets her sights um, on winning federal legislation, right? laws out of Congress, that will challenge and defeat both the state laws and the intimidation and violence that are keeping black voters from the polls. Um, she knows that what black Americans need is what we come to call the Voting Rights Act, um, but this is her vision um, all the way back in 1920. How to get there? Well, Hallie Quinn Brown, I think like many women in the leadership at the NACWC, um, carries with her a, a somewhat begrudging admiration for women like Carrie Chapman Catt from, the, um, from NASA, from, uh, for Alice Paul in the national, at the National Women's Party. These are the women um, who had seen through the campaign for the 19th Amendment uh, in the face of tremendous adversity. Um, they are skilled and effective and connected um, politicians. And part of Brown's idea is that perhaps now that the 19th Amendment has been secured, these women might be willing to set aside some of the anti-Black racism that had animated that campaign and link arms with Black women to uh, secure voting rights um, for all. In the fall, excuse me, in February of 1921, um, a contingent from the NACWC um, calls on Alice Paul at the meeting, uh, the annual meeting of the National Women's Party, um, and they propose to her a partnership um, in which now American women across the color line would work together to win federal legislation. Precisely what Alice Paul uh, says um, is uh, lost to the historical record, um, but we know what Alice Paul does next. And what she does is begin to fold up the National Women's Party. Um, and by 1923, 24, 
Paul has moved on from the struggle for voting rights and is taken up a campaign for a new federal amendment, um, that equal rights amendment that is still today awkwardly working to make its way toward ratification. Um, she's not willing to partner with Hallie Quinn Brown in the NACWC. And so black women um, are um, there on their own to build um, another movement for voting rights, um, one that will take us indeed across more than four decades um, to 1965 and the passage of the Voting Rights Act that year. Um, this is a campaign that's familiar to, um, I imagine most of us, but I'll remind it, mind us, it has three prongs. Um, there is a legal campaign, um, largely spearheaded by the NAACP and later its legal defense fund, um, chipping away, um, using the constitution, using lobbying to chip away at some of the Jim Crow strictures that are keeping black Americans from the polls, successfully challenging whites only primaries, grandfather clauses, um, even defeating the poll tax late in the story. Um, the legal campaign is essential. Um, secondly, there is the ground game of American politics and black women do not miss the opportunity um, in these long four plus decades um, to roll up their sleeves and to get in the trenches in each and every election season. Probably the most powerful example comes from the city of Chicago, um, where the great anti-lynching anti crusader, journalist, and suffragist Ida Wells is among those that have organized Black women um, and have gotten them registered into the polls um, since 1913. Um, by the 1920s, now, Black women in Chicago are inside the Republican Party. Um, they are um, deliberately organizing to get one, uh, one another registered and to the polls. And they are voting as a block um, in the 1920s and successfully moving the needle on election day. Importantly, it is from Chicago that Oscar de Priest will go to Congress in 1928. Um, why? In important to an important degree because those black women um, had organized and were using their votes strategically. Um, De Priest is the first black man to go to Congress um, since 1901 in defiance of um, the structures of Jim Crow that would have kept him away. So there is this ground game that black women continue to work. And finally, of course, um, there is the civil rights movement civil rights revolution, which by the 1940s um, brings black women to the fore um, as organizers, um, as strategists, of course, um, but also as foot soldiers. Um, and this movement, a whole story unto itself, um, is that movement that will hold the feet of Congress, hold the feet of the political parties, hold the feet ultimately of President Lyndon Johnson to the fire of voting rights um, and will um, successfully um, secure the Voting Rights Act in 1965. One of the questions I often get um, is, um, has anything changed? Um, and so I think that's where I wanna take us before I wrap up and um, have a chance to hear um, important comments. Um, in some ways, um, I hope you've heard, even in this brief presentation, um, that there is an unsettling, um, eerie um, set of parallels between 1920 um, and the 2020s, um, that story about voting rights on the one hand and voter suppression on the other, that use of facially neutral laws, that use of intimidation, violence. Um, we have returned in many ways um, to the kinds of struggles um, that the women of Vanguard um, faced on the front lines of voting rights more than a hundred years ago. And still um, things have changed. Um, 
I think it's fair to say that outside of black communities in the United States in 1920, um, there were few Americans who, even in their imaginations, regarded black women as people of consequence in the body politic. Um, that um, the women of Vanguard as real as they were, as flesh and blood as they were, um, were unimaginable um, to many Americans. Um, certainly um, discounted um, by those who um, indeed did see them. Um, and I think that's not where we are here a hundred plus years later. Um, that um, while our struggles over voting rights are hardly complete, they are upon us. Um, it is also true that black women are recognized today as a force in American politics more than firsts, um, but a force. Um, I'll take you back not so far to the election cycle of 2020 to remind you in, in that season, 130 black women, a record shattering number of black women run for seats in Congress. That's Congress alone, right? That doesn't account for state and local posts. Um, it's a record shattering number. Um, one measure of how black women have become a force and are becoming a force. Um, we could look behind the scenes at um, the political campaigns, in particular, the Biden-Harris campaign of 1920, and we would find influential, powerful, um, savvy black women um, calling the shots behind the scenes um, for the Democratic Party um, and for the candidates um, in um, nearly every um, facet of that work. Um, not all politics happens um, under the lights, in front of the lights of the cameras um, and black women in 2020 um, were everywhere behind the scenes. And I'm sure you glimpsed um, some of them yourselves as you followed that campaign. Um, that strategy developed by black women in Chicago and elsewhere in the 1920s still held um, in 2020 um, when black women deliberated, organized, and voted um, as a block um, using their numbers um, to move the needle on election day. We learned in 2020 how those um, narrow margins can make um, a profoundly consequential difference. Um, now, not only in local and state level contests, but in national contests um, as well, that voting block. And I know no one has missed um, uh, Kamala Harris today, Vice President Kamala Harris. And I wanna end with um, Kamala Harris um, because um, I was somebody who in August of 2020, when um, then Senator Harris um, was uh, slated to accept the Democratic nomination, she was gonna run, run alongside Joe Biden. Um, uh, I was somebody who, you know, made my house get quiet and um, got my good place on the sofa um, and um, tuned in. Um, yes, it was going to be a historic moment um, by any measure, but what I really wanted to um, do was hear what she would say, um, how she would explain um, not only who she was, but how she would explain how she had come to this moment in 2020 when she was going to be on the Democratic Party's nominee for vice president. Um, uh, and she didn't disappoint. Um, she very forthrightly begins her remarks um, talking about the women on whose shoulders uh, she stood that evening, um, the first, her own mother. Um, you know the story likely, an immigrant from India, um, a medical researcher, 
who raises two daughters, um, Kamala and Maya, tells them there are no limits on that which to they, they might to which they might aspire. Um, uh, and Kamala Harris tells us how she stands on her own mother's shoulders. Um, but then she goes on to invoke six women. And they are six women um, from Vanguard, um, six women of the Vanguard. Um, Kamala Harris tells us about how she is situated in history. She does not invoke Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, or Carrie Chapman Cat. She doesn't invoke Frederick Douglass or Martin Luther King Jr. Instead, she invokes six black women, and this is the quiz part of the evening. Um, six women, Mary Church Terrell, Mary McLeod Bethune, Diane Nash, Fannie Lou Hamer, Constance Baker, Motley, and Shirley Chisholm. Um, it was a new pantheon of American political leadership on display that evening. Um, my phone began to you know, buzz um, because um, folks know what I had been working on. Um, but many more Americans began to Google uh, because um, these were not all names um, that were familiar, um, that rang a bell. Um, they were not the names that many Americans um, expected to hear. Um, so um, part of the story um, of this book um, is indeed to try and help us understand the stories that 21st century Black women tell us um, about their own political trajectories, their political imaginations, their political visions um, to an individual. Um, when we listen, what we hear are their invocations of the women of the vanguard, um, this long history of Black women's political struggle, um, activism, vision, um, and more. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to end um, right on time and say, again, thank you um, very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm not sure who's coming back on to um, join me, but um, thank you all very much. I look forward to the questions, comments, and the discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. That was that was wonderful and right on time. You're a pro. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. Um, lots to think about. Um, and what we thought we would do this evening is, you know, put two of two of my favorite people on the spot um, by having them listen to you, lean in and be pre prepared to give some remarks right after it. So um, I'm going to call up to the stage um, to to um, two folks who I respect and who do a lot of work on, on Black women as well. Um, so I will first introduce Dr. Ida Campbell-Jones, soon to be Dr. Ida Campbell-Jones. I'm, I'm speaking it into existence. Um, Ida is a PhD student um, in our Department of Sociology right here at the University of Missouri. She did her, her bachelor's degree here at Mizzou also in Black Studies and Political Science. Um, uh, Ida works on gender, sexuality, identity, music, and, and pop culture. And so um, Ida will speak first, um, and I've just asked her to, to, to respond with, with, some, with some thoughts that were inspired by, by, your, by your talk. And then after Ida, she will, um, our, our next speaker will be Dr. Kiana um, Irvin, who is the Associate Professor of History here at Mizzou. She's also affiliated with Black Studies, Women and Gender Studies, um, as well as Peace Studies and the Middleton Center. Um, she holds a BA from, from Duke and her MA and PhD are from the University of Washington. Um, she's working on an, an, incredible, an incredible new book right now, but her first book um, is called Gateway to Equality, Black Women and the Struggle for Economic Justice in St. Louis. So um, those are our two. I got to, to choose them. So I immediately went to, to Ida and Kiana. Um, and so we'll start with Ida. Um, Ida, you've got the floor for about five minutes. Thanks. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Shonakin, and for putting me first, putting me on the spot. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I really appreciated everything you had to say. Um, I enjoyed your talk. Uh, first, I want to talk about the things that I appreciated from your book. I got to read a considerable amount of it. Um, and I love the fact that you tell our political histories from our perspective and not necessarily from like our repressed perspective or from like a sense of oppression because it made me feel like I was, um, you know, just reading my own history the way that white people are able to read their history. Um, and I think the first note that I wrote when I was listening, I listened to your book, um, I wrote, go big or go home, because small leaves you with just as much disappointment, so you might as well take all of your chances. And that's what I got from, um, I think, either your first chapter or your introduction. So, like, why not, you know, take all the chances that we have, because as Black women, we have nothing to lose. So that's, um, I think those are the, the biggest points that I got um, that really stuck out to me. Um, and you tell like our story without like a sense of othering, which I really appreciate. Um, hearing our stories, like we don't really get that many chances to, to hear that and to feel that. So um, that's what I really appreciate from your book so far. Um, I know I'm not gonna take up all of the five minutes, but um, I really liked, I always like when people mention St. Louis because I'm from St. Louis. And um, I, it's just so striking to me how almost every event, every um, discussion of activism is brought back to St. Louis, Missouri because there's so much history in St. Louis and East St. Louis um, and in Chicago and just in the Midwest. And I feel like people, tend to forget um, or leave the Midwest behind and focus on the South or talk about the North and they really don't get to hear our stories. Um, and I think, uh, I thank you for that because um, you're, getting, you're highlighting my hometown and my city, but also like people like me who are from St. Louis wanting to tell those stories. Um, I just find that to be I, I thank you. I find I'm very gracious of you doing that. Um, I have a question. Um, I noticed how um, I took note of when you said Black women are considered a force in politics. And I find myself grappling with that a lot of, yes, we are a force, you know, the listen to Black women, um, you know, how people, there's this whole wave now of Black women know. Thank Black women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank Black women. Black women are going to save the world, um, which I think we have that, like, inherent, like, ability to do, but we are here cleaning up a mess that we didn't make. And I um, I think about that so often when I realize that maybe I'm doing too much sometimes. Like sometimes we, we take on too much, of, um, too much political responsibility, social responsibility, especially in places that are so overpowering. Um, like in Missouri, we're a red state, like so many rooms and committees and whatever, what have you, I've noticed like my voice is not heard in this space. So I'm going to take it elsewhere. So like so many Black women, we find ourselves like taking on that responsibility. Um, but also, I also have like the thought of creating our own community in certain spaces, like the Michael Middleton Center. We've created our own community, um, like how the um, Gainesville Black Culture Center used to be. I'm not sure how it is now, but we create our own community within spaces. So I kind of have a question of like, what do you have to say about um, 
fixing things from the inside is 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 the is the phrase um but also like making our own community like where's where do you think the bridge is in that um i think that's my question <laughs> Excellent, Ida. Thank you. Very, very thoughtful. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure that we will. So, Dr. Jones, do you do you want to, to go ahead and answer that, or should we go to Kiana and then come back? As you prefer. I okay, go ahead and answer and um, answer Ida's question. Well, first of all, Ida, let me say thank you so much for um, engaging with the book and the care you've taken with it. I, I, it's really the, the highest compliment I think any writer could ask for, right? Is a, is a careful, critical reader. And so um, I really um, appreciate your observations um, and your comments and, and your question very much. Um, uh, let me just say a little bit about St. Louis. You know, um, uh, it's not an accident that um, I, I, sort of prowl the archives in St. Louis, um, because partly I'm looking for the women in my own family who are from St. Louis and um, are there in 1920 um, when the 19th Amendment has been ratified. And, um, and my own great grandmother, um, Fannie Williams, is a member of that um, Phyllis, Phyllis Wheatley branch of the YWCA and is um, behind the scenes there um, helping to um, uh, stand up and run their suffrage school in those years. Um, so, um, so I guess my mother would say I can buy St. Louis honestly, um, which is to say um, I wanted um, very much, right, to um, on the one hand uh, discover uh, the women in my own family in this story. And you know, I start the book with a, a bit of that. Um, uh, and there's a longer version of that story, but I, I, I did that very deliberately um, in part because that continues to be part of my process of accountability is an accountability to them. Um, and at the same time, I wanted to open the door, you know, a, a little wider for all of us, right? To bring our families, our communities, our histories um, to the table um, when we do our work. Um, whether we're from St. Louis or um, wherever we're from. Um, so, um, so it's a special um, privilege to be here with natives of St. Louis, brilliant scholars of St. Louis. Um, it's a little intimidating, I will say, but, um, but it's to say um, as a really important part of the story for me, even though it doesn't take up a whole lot of space in the book. Um, you know, this question of, um, the burden, right, uh, uh, that Black women, I think, do um, bear or um, have laid on them in 21st century political culture is something I've thought about a lot. And I'm somebody who has written um, back in 2020 about the, you know, you know, basically, if you want to thank Black women, um, you know, follow them. Right? <laughs> and, and, you know, we don't need hashtags and we don't need, you um, you know, Venmo drinks, right? We need folks to like, you know, get information, right? And, um, and permit black women to fully lead. Um, so I, I think that's such an important point. Um, really, I, 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 when I say black women are a force, part of what I'm pushing back against is the fetidization of the firsts. Um, there's a woman at the end of this book, um, Patricia Roberts Harris, who is indeed the first black woman diplomat for the United States. She's ambassador to Luxembourg, um, sent there by Lyndon Johnson. Um, but what she says when she is sworn in is, don't call me a first, because you don't recognize what faint praise that is, what a twisted compliment that is, because what it really means when you dub us firsts is that too many black women who should have been here were denied, 
right? And you don't realize what you're confessing, right? Is the deep structural racism and sexism that has kept women like me before. Now, I want to say I learned this first from Dr. Mary Frances Berry, um, great historian, um, activist, and mentor, um, who always said to me, you know, when I would, you know, prattle on about finding somebody who was the first this or that, you know, she's always say, you know, the real story is about the women who didn't get there, right, who didn't make it. Um, and I think Dr. Um, Barry is very much right. Um, so um, I think that the, you're right, that the, the force dimension, the burden is a lonely, um, taxing, um, uh, weight that black women carry. Um, and yet, as a nation, we are indebted right, to black women who have a vision for democracy um, that is unlike any other for most of our history, unlike any other. And that is a lonely, a lonely burden for most of this book, certainly. And it continues to be in too many rooms um, today. Um, and I don't have an answer for how we escape that because it turns out in my view, right? This is a book about women who are visionaries about what a democracy should be, what it can be, what it should aspire to be. And they have few peers for most of this story. Um, and so what would we be, right? What would we be as troubled as we are, right? In 2022, what would we be, right? Without um, women who spoke to um, intersectional inequalities um, and called them out and, and, and set the bar high for this country, um, it's hard for me to imagine precisely who we'd be or what we'd be, but I'm interested to know what Dr. Irvin has to say. So um, again, before, I'll thank you. Dr. I, Irvin, before you speak, I did want to respond to what you um, just said, Dr. Jones, about it being lonely, because I realized um, how you wrote every chapter. Like, um, I, I listen, like, I'm, I'm better when I listen to audiobooks and listening to it, like, the way that you wrote every chapter and kind of like focused on one woman and or one woman primarily in each chapter, you kind of like envisioned that loneliness in their journey. And that was just really cool for to listen to and to read in your book. Thank you. Dr. Irvin. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Shonakin. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell, the Middleton Center for, for having me. It's, it's an honor um, to, to speak to and, and about um, Dr. Jones, uh, who's, uh, you know, I uh, look up to as a pioneer and a, just a credible historian of Black women's history. Um, so, uh, this is this is I'm giddy I'm giddy um, I'm 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 thrilled to be here. So, you know, I thought um, I, I too have had a chance to read uh, Vanguard, uh, which does such important work. So I thought I would just reflect sort of more broadly on what I think is 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 so critical in terms of the the contribution of a work like this and 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 what Dr. Jones is sort of present is is presenting to us. Um, she calls black women and their 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 quest for the vote and for equality. She calls them um, America's original feminists and anti-racists, the original OFs or the OAs, if you will. And you know, this is this is an important um, an important contribution, an important reframing. I think a radical, in fact, reframing. Of the nation's history, and 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 you know, Dr. Jones, I think is not simply saying that black women are anticipating movements to come or conceptual frameworks to come, but that they are actually setting a blueprint for political action, for community and movement building, for deep systemic change. That they are setting, they are 
visionaries, as as you said, they are um, architects. They are they are mapping out a trajectory for deep change. If only folks would follow, right? As you said, Dr. Jones. Also, this notion of Black women just as political actors is, I think, an important um, uh, point that's made here. Um, and politics that involves everything. And I mean that quite literally, right? So yes, it's about the suffrage and the vote, but uh, and also so many other things, so many other issues. So it's that expansive and broad and deep vision um, of Black women's sort of understanding of equality and freedom um, that makes this book, I think, so so important, and in, 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 in every page, every story that we that we encounter sort of unfolds this deep um, and expansive sort of vision. You know, this idea of Black women moving sort of from the specific to the universal that their that their um, freedom dreams pulling from sort of Rob, Dr. Robin Kelly's notion, their freedom dreams are based on their particular lived realities, but that those visions then if implemented and in, implemented fully would mean a kind of freedom for all, liberation for all. Um, and, and finally, I'll just say that, um, and I do have a, a, a question, um, what I also really appreciate about the book is how it's that it is sweeping. It's a long history. 200 years of history that begins in the antebellum period in the 1820s and traces, of course, the story basically up to the present. And so, you know, in that sweeping sort of retelling, we have a sort of new political history of the United States, one that is far more complicated, that traces a kind of genealogy of political action that disrupts basic chronologies of US history, our basic conceptualizations of watersheds and these sort of turning point moments. Um, and this is what black history does when, when done well, and, and Dr. Jones is certainly a model for this, when done well, black, black women's history changes the method, the, con the concept, the periodization, everything changes everything. So. Deep appreciation, Dr. Jones, for your work. Um, and a question just about um, this, this sort of thinking of our, our current moment. And you mentioned um, Kamala Harris sort of pointing to um, figures like Fannie Lou Hamer and others sort of rewriting sort of this history and, and naming these women um, and making an important intervention in that way. The rise of figures like Stacey Abrams, um, the, uh, the attention, I think Latasha Brown, the work of sort of Black women who are doing important work around the franchise, seems that we're in a moment in which we're searching for a kind of usable past that disrupts sort of these, you know, these sort of tried and true prevailing understandings of our American heroes and so forth, voting and, and, and the like. And I just wondered if you could give, from your sense, what's sort of giving rise to this search for and recovery of a past that's more usable for us. That is that, that, you know, sort of, and what about the times I think occasions, you know, the naming of, of Hamer and others as these key figures um, in the sort of long history of, of uh, the fight for democracy in the United States. So deep appreciation again, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Urban. And there's a lot there, so I, I'm gonna try. Um, uh, but I want to I want to um, speak to a couple of things you said, and then I, I will um, answer your question. You know, um, I I think there's a way in which um, for example, you know, because I do this, um, the, the, the effect of doing a, a long kind of, you know, long history um, is, you know, has, a, has an effect for the reader, but it also has an effect for the researcher, right? That you begin to discern threads um, that you couldn't see. I couldn't see my first book when 1830 to 1900, that's not nothing, but it wasn't enough really to see much of what um, I was able to see by kind of taking this long look. And um, 
just the, the, the words that like, like the word humanity kept coming up and I, I just didn't know what it, how to, what it meant. Um, but when I, as we do, right, as you encounter it again and again, and in my case, across generations, you realize black women are telling you something about their aspirations, about their visions, um, about their dreams. And it is about humanity and not about some, um, you know, parody of identity politics at all. Um, and that to me was a revelation, right? That, you know, as far back as the 1860s, if not earlier, black women are already talking about what today we might term human rights. Um, and that is far more expansive than a debate about whether white women or black men should get the vote first. Um, it's far more ambitious than that. Um, and so, um, so it's to say, I think that um, I learned as a researcher and a writer um, what I could gain by trying to take the long view. Absolutely intimidated by coming onto your, you know, turf, you know, coming into the 20th century, for example. You know, I, I, I'm really, um, I'm a 19th century historian, um, and that was terrifying. I wanted initially to end this book in 1920. Right. But it was the women I was researching who said, you can't stop in 1920. Right. We're just getting started. Right? We're just getting started in this struggle. And um, so we're also responding right, to what's coming to us um, through the archive. Um, you know, this um, moment with Kamala Harris, um, uh, I think, is actually um, an old story here. And um, it's not quite in Vanguard, but I wrote a, a short piece for the New York Times about how black women um, early in the 20th century use names um, like the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA, um, that that is not exceptional. That is the norm in the early 20th century that black women, whether they're creating you know, church groups or clubs or Ys, um, they are reaching back to the 19th century and they are pulling that history into the present. Um, it inspires, it's instructional. Um, they are really the keepers of that sort of political um, memory. Hallie Quinn Brown, who I mentioned um, in 1926, publishes her book, Home Spun Heroines and Other Women of Distinction. I love that book and you can find it online. Um, it's been digitized um, at Documenting the American South among other places. But Hallie Quinn Brown, right, presides over the collection of these biographies, the preservation of these memories and they all speak to each in their own way, the capacity of black women for um, political rights and political leadership. Um, so I think it's an old tradition that we, um, you know, that we have um, inherited in the 21st century. Um, and for me, there was something so affirming about history, right, as a, as a facet of political culture, as a facet of freedom dreams in finding women across so many generations reaching back and pulling women who came before them. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, I think that one of the things this book is about is about the work across generations. And this goes a bit, I think, to um, Ida, your, your question point, which, you know, is that um, I think the women in this book understand that um, very little of what they aspire to or what they aim for will be realized in their own lives. And so they come to politics with this um, generational, pat, you know, today was a paying it forward, um, you know, training um, next generations, preparing next generations um, to do the work. And I think that the, the naming, the invocation of the names, the, um, the um, articulation of the history is one of the ways, right, in which we um, remind ourselves that we're engaged in work that um, is not about our own moment, though we are rightly concerned and, and, and deeply engaged in our own moment, 
um, but that we are inheriting things and then we are we are passing them forward right to next generations i was fascinated by how many edu- how many of the women in this book begin their professional lives their public lives as educators i wanted to be in those school rooms and understand what's going on at the turn of the century in like washington dc's m street high school and mary church terrell is on the faculty and um and, and then the women who come next, you know, are in the seats. And what on earth, is Anna Julia Cooper, what on earth was it like to be a student of these women? Um, but I think that's part of the story is how we are always passing that on and, 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 and passing it forward. So thank you so much um, to both of you. I, I, I really, I appreciate all of that very much. Thanks, Dr. Jones. Um, so um, I'm gonna ask um, folks to start thinking about the questions they might want to ask our panelists. Um, but but as people are thinking about it, um, I will ask a question of my own um, to all three of you. And I, I also will want um, Tracy to, to join us on stage um, to also um, engage here. Um, so my question has to do a little bit with what you just said, Dr. Jones, which is that, um, you know, if we if we think about the the women, the vanguard, um, so many of them started in in education. Um, all five of us on this screen are 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 in the same in the same profession, um, and you know, if as we think about folks like Ida B. Wells and Mary um, McLeod um, Bethune, um, they, were, they were doing this work as well. Um, Ida mentioned earlier something about it being a very lonely, um, a, a lonely journey for these women. Um, I, think, I think now it's not as lonely because we see each other, we read each other's works, we, 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 we know that we're out there. Um, but we know um, that um, Ida B. Wells was famously run out of Memphis, right, for the good work that that she was doing. Um, and I think there's a sense sometimes, at least I feel it sometimes in administration, um, I, I, I think that there's a sense of you know, the boundaries, you know, where, what I can say and what I shouldn't say. Um, in the classroom, you know, we're in Missouri, you know, there are all kinds of, of threats against the kinds of work that we want to, to do. So we're constantly finding ourselves policing our language and the topics and so on. So my question for all, actually all, all of us here um, is, you know, what, what lessons can we take from the Vanguard? Um, about how to how to live and live well um, and do the work um, and still and remain and remain healthy, you know, in 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 this current moment. Um, you know, we don't all live in the White House, or you know, we're not all Kamala, but um, but but we're all trying to make a make a contribution. So maybe if we can talk about that, and then Tracy will. We'll start with Dr. Jones, Kiana, Ida, and then we'll we'll go to to Tracy. And Tracy has, I think, a little bit more more to say. So, um, Dr. Jones, you want to start? Um, sure. Uh, and just two um, brief thoughts. Um, the first is that um, for much of this um, story, uh, the women I write about are um, live in a world that is shaped by American apartheid um, by segregation. And um, in fact, it means that they work in community with one another, right? M Street High School in Washington is a, a Black high school, and there are Black men and women educators there um, who um, have community in part by virtue of um, the structures of Jim Crow. Um, uh, Hallie Quinn Brown teaches at Wilberforce University, a historically Black college. Um, and talk, if there was one place I could transport myself in this book, it would be right to the dinner table at Wilberforce because so many of the black women suffragists come through Wilberforce, teach at Wilberforce. And, and we don't have precisely that, right? In, in the same way, I think that, um, that they did. Um, but the other thing I, I just wanna, I, I wanna uh, 
recommend the work of Dr. Stephanie Evans um, because Dr. Evans has really worked importantly on how black women activists um, engage in what today we call um, self-care. Um, you know, I will never forget being at a talk of hers and her showing us um, Rosa Parks practicing yoga. And wow, so um, Dr. Evans's work, I think is really teaching us um, that we also have a tradition um, of, of self-care. Um, we do have traditions about sustaining ourselves, about our wellness, um, and we need to recover those too alongside the history of struggle. And, and her work is really, I think, uh, exemplary in that regard. Yes, and Stephanie is currently working on, on, on a book on Black women and wine. So that must be one way that we, <laughs> that we cope. <laughs> okay, um, let's go to Ida. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Jones. Um, I don't have like a direct answer for your question, but um, I think we can do this by reminding ourselves of what Dr. Jones had mentioned not long um, ago was engage with our work with the knowledge that we may not see the fruits of our labor in this lifetime, but like know that it still has value and it still has impact because um, even though I'm, I'm still fairly young, but I still have um, the ability to, you know, impact younger generations and break generational curses, like um, teach the younger generations what we are just now learning. Um, and I think, you know, you know, start the ball rolling earlier so they can probably see the fruits of their labor in their lifetime. Um, and I think that's, that's a good way to healthily and um, to, I forgot what you, what your question was, but to healthily, you know, um, create change well, and to, um, make those changes because um, I'm, I'm really big on creating community and, you know, keeping the love and care and energy within our community um, because, you know, we can't grow as an ecosystem if we don't water it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where I know that my work is going to go back into my community, back into St. Louis, back into young black girls. So I think that's, um, I think that's my answer that's good. That's <laughs> in a good. nutshell. In a nutshell, that's good. Uh, uh, Kiana? Yeah, just briefly, I, I you know, I, I, I think um, one sort of beautiful theme of Vanguard is, is, is black women's sociality, their gathering, uh, the, 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 the centrality of assembly you know, um, and the, the foundational nature of it um, and what happens sort of in those spaces. And that if we're thinking about not just political work, but well-being, um, a sense of shared and linked fate, um, solidarity, um, concern for survival and thriving, that's also going on in these spaces. And we should understand, I think, politics is sort of emanating from you know, the, the, the notion of, of, of looking out for each other, the, the notion of mutual aid and care. I think um, Black women have a very radical understanding throughout their history of care um, and what that, what that all entails. So um, gathering is what I would say, assembly. Um, kitchen, this is a history of kitchen, what Black women say at kitchen tables and clubs and churches and organizations and their mutual aid societies at Sunday school meetings and the, and on and on and on. Um, and so those gathering spaces are, are, are the groundwork for this kind of care, I think. Yeah. Good, love it, thank you. Um, Tracy, thoughts? Well, I was thinking of Mary Maccabi's book about um, abolition and she says, hope is a discipline. It's not an aspiration, it's something you do every day. And um, unlike the women of those times, and I'm thinking of um, Sarah Maps Douglas in her art, in her literary club, um, they didn't have a place to go besides themselves. 
And so they developed, um, I guess, a strength. And even though they were contentious, because there was another outlet for them, um, they really learned to um, manage discomfort. And so um, I know in her book, Julietta Singh uses Jamaica Kane Cade's book, uh, My Mother's Garden, to talk about cultivating discomfort. And these are really difficult things to put together, hope and discomfort. And um, we don't, at least here in our local area, we don't have a lot of spaces um, that are like the Sarah Maps or the Halle Quinn uh, Brown. We, those, are, those are in the very fraught spaces on top of that. So um, I think um, in our generation, it's that becoming really comfortable with who you are and that all the visions that the women have in this book are radical. Their idea of mutual um, assessment that no one gets left behind, right? That, that black feminist belief that no one gets left behind, particularly people who are vulnerable and marginalized, that is a lonely place because that is a radical way of thinking. And we've always thought that pretty much. And it, that's, that's why if, they're, if we're gonna make a big deal about us saving the world, it's because we recognize that our philosophy about taking care of our community works when we're allowed to do it and implement it and talk about it and be heard, it works. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks, Tracy. Um, all right, so um, all this is food for my soul. And so um, I, as, I, as I think about these responses, um, I'm going to go to the question. So if you have a question, go ahead and put your hand up um, using the reaction, um, the reaction tool right there. Or, or if you want to put put your put your hand up this way, that's fine too. Or, or yeah, or you can put it in in the chat. So, Dr. Jones, there is a question in in the chat from um, Manny Liscom, who is a professor in biology here at at Mizzou, and Manny is asking. He says, first, let me apologize that I have not read the book yet, but he just ordered it. And, and I can confirm that because <laughs> he was texting me. Um, but I can only assume that Diane Nash and Fanny Lou Hamer hold spots in, in, in the vanguard. My question is the efforts of both Nash and, and Hamer to secure the vote for all Americans, disenfr disenfranchised African-Americans, especially in the 1960s, 40 years after the 19th was ratified. I wonder if Dr. Jones came across any reflections by either of, or both of those women um, about the frustrations they must have felt to, to be fighting the same fight as Ida B. Wells of the prior generation. I hope this question makes sense. I think it does. Oh, it makes uh, tremendous sense. Um, and it's an important reflection, I think, out of this book. Um, if you haven't um, ever um, seen uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's remarks in 1964. It's Atlantic City um, on the floor of the Democratic National Convention. She's come to uh, the convention to upset it um, because the, uh, the Democrats have seated an all white delegation from the state of Mississippi without the consultation or consent of black Mississippians. Mrs. Hamer brings a contingent from the her party, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and the struggle um, both in front of the cameras and behind the scenes during that convention is over um, the seating of that um, contingent, that alternate contingent. Um, and Mrs. Hamer will not succeed. Um, but she does have her eight plus minutes um, in front of the credentials committee um, in a speech that is um, broadcast um, nationally ultimately and very much um, is part of that holding the feet of the nation to the fire. Um, so I recommend those eight minutes if you want a flavor of Fannie Lou Hamer um, and a sense of how she manages and how she um, mobilizes, sorry, that's my uh, neighborhood, um, how she manages and mobilizes, right? That frustration, right? That anger and turns it into action. I think that's one way to think about the question. At the same time, there are women in this story. Um, they, they make relatively brief appearances, but they are critical who turn away from suffrage politics, who turn away from party politics, 
Um, there are women in the, in the 19 teens who walk away from this story and from these scenes and join, for example, the Garvey movement um, and adopt a Pan-African vision, um, a, a vision of self, you know, black self-determination on a global scale um, as a rebuke of, um, yes, their frustrations, but a rebuke, right, of a, a system that has for too long um, continued to deny them um, a place at the table. Um, and so while those women in my story make brief appearances, they are a critical um, dimension of the bigger picture, right? Black women who um, are profound critics of this system and um, develop and contribute to and join alternative political movements um, largely on the left and occasionally on the right, um, but alternative political movements precisely because they um, experience the kind of frustration that, um, that you're alluding to. So I, I thank you very much for the question. Anyone else on the panel have a thought on this question? I see um, Tracy, you're talking about um, Shirley Ch Chisholm as well, right? As yeah, she was in a very lonely place, and she thought that the feminists that she was working with were going to support her in her bid for president. And they wanted a black woman to run, a uh, woman to run, and lo and behold, she found herself in a very lonely place that they didn't really want to support her. Um, and I didn't know that uh, Polly Murray really struggled with um, supporting uh, supporting um, Shirley Chisholm. And I, I only came to understand that more recently, but that would just be a really stunningly painful experience to be Shirley Chisholm. And another black woman like Polly Murray um, does not um, support you, so. Great, okay, good. Um, other questions? Dr. Mitchell has his hand up. Okay, I can't see. Uh, yeah, I see you. Go ahead, David. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. I've got sort of a, a question or a comment on the questions in this is that first, uh, I hope that your work doesn't end up on the banned book list, given that it may make some people feel uncomfortable, given that it's gonna be pushing some buttons clearly around the country and that it will be. Um, Cause it clearly, people clearly need to sort of understand the 200 year history, hope it doesn't end up <laughs> where the 1619 project is getting sort of shunted, right? Um, when you were sort of talking, I was thinking in my mind about hidden figures and about the Say Her Name campaign and about all the names of these individuals who were so instrumental in moving these particular significant rights along who have been lost both in terms of our general American history, but quite honestly also lost in our, in our Black history, right? That these are the names that are often not in that, as you said, the pantheon of names that Kamala produced. Um, the question I have is sort of a little bit uh, conflated in the sense, so I do work on, on the disenfranchisement of the formerly incarcerated. And we see that, right, there's been a growing number of women, of black women now, and women who are being incarcerated and being disenfranchised through a very, through this sort of 14th amendment legal method, right, of how we excluding individuals. And thinking about that in context with what you said about the 130 who were part of the election process for Congress, is this is this now a second vanguard that's on the on the horizon? That is the is the first being forestalled in a way with gerrymandering laws and new laws about voting rights that we've returned back to a period of having to basically reconceptualize the push for voting rights uh, in a very real way to counter what is a new attack, if you. Um, I guess the first thing to say, I'm not sure if you'll be disappointed or feel affirmed, but um, this book has been suppressed um, uh, in, uh, in a locale in the state of Louisiana um, and uh, uh, by a public library who, um, deemed it and a, a, not only Vanguard, but a, a handful of books on the history of voting rights and voter suppression is um, not sufficiently um, engaged with both sides of the story. I actually think Vanguard does a good job um, of telling both sides of the story, 
the other side, if you will, the side of folks who are engaged in voter suppression um, throughout this book um, don't fare as well in the book. It's true, but they are they are essential. You can't understand the story if you don't understand folks there. So, um, so it turns out that it is controversial in some quarters to tell the history of Black women's struggles for voting rights, um, unfortunately. Um, your second question, um, I, I guess, um, you know, on the one hand, I think that um, I was committed from the very beginning um, to the kind of work you allude to, which is to say I wanted to um, offer up new names, um, new faces, new histories, um, new figures um, in a pantheon. That's partly a response to the way in which the history of um, the story, the story of the 19th Amendment has been told for so long. You know, I was really looking to make some room on the pedestal alongside Stanton and Anthony and um, Catman Chat and uh, Alice Paul um, and others. And I think there were pitfalls in that, of course, because um, individual women, um, you know, inevitably really stand in for the, for a whole, right? For some whole, right? For some collective. Um, and so partly what you're encountering in this book is something, um, I guess, uh, strategic, um, strategic uh, uh, on my part, um, you know, that if I could, if I could leave everybody with six women who they didn't know before, um, you know, maybe everybody more or less knows, I don't know who in this book, Sojourner Truth, maybe, I don't know, I, you know, um, that I think that was part of my goal. Um, but the pitfalls there are, of course, that um, we don't, it's not a history um, that is um, rooted enough in, in social movements in the way that it might, in the ways that others, um, I think, would importantly um, tell this story. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but that's, that's what it brings to mind, Dr. Mitchell. Did I answer your question? Well, yeah, no, no. And, and actually, just comment on, on what I think is this invisibility of Black women's space in place, right? And thinking about, I mean, until the movie Hidden Figures come out, you would think that Black women didn't do math, right? Yeah. You would think that you didn't, they had no role in the space program, right? Uh, until you hear the story and see, uh, you know, where the, where the role has been or the invisibility exists, right? So you don't see that representation, quite frankly. Yeah, you know, I, so I guess the other thing I would say is that, um, uh, you know, I know folks aren't always eager to read the footnotes, but at least peruse them because this is a book, if you talk about standing on shoulders, right? This is the book that stands, a book that stands on the shoulders of, of really three generations of black women's political historians. Um, I couldn't have written it without that. And so part of the, part of my reflection um, is about how we as academic historians do and do not take our work into other places. And this is very deliberately a book that was intended to read, be read by, you know, my granddaughters um, and my students, um, you know, our mothers and grandmothers um, as much as by um, specialists. Um, specialists know a lot of the story, um, I'd venture to say. Um, uh, but part of the turn for me was in thinking about um, how to take what we have gathered and learned and discerned um, the figures that, you know, Ida and Kiana, Tracy and I, you know, that we all, like many of us know very well. Um, and um, and bring them to a different readership. That's part of what this book is about. And I I am someone um, who I think will never um, you know retreat from that aspect of our work, which is um, bringing academic work to a, a broader readership and and making it part of a, a, a broader conversation. 
So I think it's partly on us. And, mm-hmm. and I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I just mean, um, for me, it was a moment to kind of rethink my purpose as a historian and to repurpose myself as a historian. Um, if I could pick up that, that thread. Oh, okay, Tracy, do you want to, to respond to that? I'm glad that you talked about um, broader readership. You know, I follow your columns in the New York Times, et cetera. And what I, I like is you define yourself as a public historian. So for those of us who are not academic geeks, will you say more about what it means to be a public historian and what does that mean for the ways that you write and engage um, the public? Um, so for those of us in academics, we understand that, but. I think for the lay audience, it's important to know um, why you, you, you talked on a little bit why you chose that way, but maybe you can expound on that a little bit more. Sure. Um, Just this week, I had um, a chance to a phone call, a wonderful phone call with a, um, a colleague journalist who's about to publish a new book and she said to me, you know, how am I gonna get historians interested in this new biography? And I was like, I don't know, right? And but the reason I said that is because, you know, much of the work we do as academic historians is um, bounded by scholarly debates. We call it historiography. Um, and um, much of the work that we do, the writing that we do, the publishing that we do um, is, an insider baseball. Um, it is, you know, scholars trying to figure out, you know, important thorny questions that are fascinating to us and might not be apparent or even interesting to anybody else. Um, and, and I think that work is essential because that is sort of ultimately the way we kind of move knowledge forward. Um, and so I'm all for, I'm in the middle of writing a book now and I'm I've got my head in the archives and, you know, below ground (laughs) most of the time as I'm trying to work through new ideas. And I, when I do surface, I'm talking to other specialists and experts. Um, So that's what, as is true in in most, if not all scholarly undertakings. Um, But at the same time, um, I would say for Black historians, you know, we also work in out of another tradition, um, a tradition that has always been publicly and politically engaged, that has always straddled those spaces. Um, But I was definitely trained to not worry so much about speaking to any human being other than other historians, speaking in a language, you know, that was accessible. Um, So, um, and I think I could have you know, and I could have a very fine career uh, doing that. Um, But I was very vexed about the prospect of the year 2020, the celebration of the 19th Amendment and Black women being elided and erased. And I knew that no amount of academic writing that I did, no amount of work I did with other historians was going to change that prospect. Um, That if I wanted to change that, I was going to have to write a different kind of book, speak to different kinds of folks. Vanguard in part is is a book written for journalists because I wanted in 2020, I wanted journalists to have a book, a book that they could pull off the shelf that would let them have something to say about black women and the 19th amendment, maybe even something insightful and informed. Um, And so um, that is, um, that's not a secret about the book, but that was really it. And and yes, right, it really, I think does the work. I'm seeing the chat. It really does the work um, that it really opens the doors Um, to lots of conversations with journalists, lots of collaborations with journalists in front of the camera, behind the camera, front of the microphone, behind the microphone, lots of, you know, print journalism, um, because it's, I have tried to um, digest with with my own, you know, um, interpretation, 
um, a great deal of work that was profoundly relevant to um, better understandings of the 19th Amendment. And so um, uh, that isn't something we're obliged to do as academic historians, it turns out, Tracy, right? I mean, we don't ever have to do that, but I just was not going to let the year go by and have folks say, oh, I had no idea. You know, I was like, no, no, you have an idea because I'm going to give you the ideas and, <laughs> and you see what you do with them. And I, and I, and I do think that it, it may, I, you know, I, and I was not alone in that. So I, I, I want to say, I don't want to overstate it, but um, those of us who came into those kinds of spaces, I think really made a difference in how the anniversary was narrated, how the exhibitions were staged and a great deal more. Um, I love that, love it. Um, there's some ideas that are are uh, kind of percolating on the on the chat that um, you know whenever Tracy is involved, you know stuff stuff happens. Um, so Mary Beth, also another favorite of mine. Um, you want to go ahead and ask your ask your question? Another historian. Yeah, it kind of goes along with what you were just talking about. But um, do you have plans for a young adult version of the book? Because I really find that those are so engaging, not only for the young adults, but also for college students who don't think they can handle or that they want to sit and read a larger book. Um, yeah. I found my niece reading one of mine off my shelf and she's 11. And we, we only had to have one, one weird question she asked it was um amazon's abolitionist and activist um but she just she was so engaged with that so yeah um so a couple of things um and thank you for that because it's so important um vanguard came out in paperback last december and um thank you to basic books my publisher for um joining me in a commitment to high school teachers um and so um, they have um, made the book available um, to high school, um, for high school classrooms. Um, they have um, supported me in speaking to um, thousands of high school teachers about the book and about how it might um, uh, fit into their um, overall curriculum and, and, and uh, that has, and it works in high school. It, it, that's been really, really gratifying is that it works in high school classrooms. For the young version, um, I don't need to write a book because my friend, um, uh, the great um, Yvette Dion um, wrote a book called Lifting As We Climb, which indeed is the YA companion, this book, um, a National Book Award finalist book, no less. Um, so I'm always happy to recommend to people um, uh, Yvette Dion's book, Lifting As We Climb, um, for, um, for younger readers, because it is um, in many ways um, a, a parallel uh, to Vanguard um, um, and one that young people can pick up and, and read for themselves. So um, thank you. I'm going to order it now. Yeah. OK, um, another colleague of mine, Devin Fergus, a historian also. Devin. Hi, uh, Dr. Jones. Thank you first for writing such a, a wonderful and brilliant book. He's going to act like he doesn't know me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Martha. <laughs> so, so um, I, I do know you. So, and um, so you've talked a lot as a historian, but now I want to talk to the the legal, the law professor side of Martha. Um, so, you talked about Kamala Harris and the, her contributions, but we also have a Supreme Court nominee. Uh, a first, if you want to use that phrasing, uh, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson. And so my question to you is, is in terms of the genealogy, who, how would you map the genealogy of, of, of Katanji Brown Jackson? It, who is she in a herd of, of uh, Constance Baker Motley, of Pauli Murray? How would you map her? Tell me what your, your, your thoughts about uh, uh, KBJ, Katanji Brown Jackson. How would you map her? Uh, thank you for that. Um, yes. Uh, you know, um, this book keeps um, keeps on giving sure. in this regard. Um, it's just a, a testament to where we are in our own time. 
Um, but um, both Polly Murray and um, Judge Constance Baker Motley um, make appearances here in Vanguard um, precisely because um, one, one, two reasons, right? One is um, this is a book um, that doesn't look to wedge black women into the places um, where they were not, um, but really looks to follow black women um, where they were and then listen well to what they're talking about. So Murray is a, a Murray is irresistible in this book in part because you know as a young person Murray Murray is not interested in electoral politics at all as a young person. Um, you know, in New York, um, she she tells us, you know, she votes for, you know, every, you know, alt candidate there might be because all her votes are about is sort of a statement and protest. She doesn't believe in party politics. She doesn't believe in the state in the way she comes to over time. Um, so her story is fascinating. And of course, you can't imagine um, sort of modern um, 20th century, late 20th century um, critical thought about women in the constitution without coming through Pauli Murray. Um, and I have a piece coming out in a, in a Georgetown Law Review about this because one of the things that's interesting about Murray is that for all she is, um, she for all of the work she does that is so um, tuned in to women's political rights, including black women's political rights, I have yet to find her invoking the 19th Amendment ever. Um, and the piece I've written is really about how by the mid 20s, black women really jettisoned the 19th Amendment. Um, they knew it before the amendment was ratified and it only becomes you know, glaringly apparent once the, the amendment is on the books that it wasn't intended for them. And Murray, even Murray, who is ambitious and creative um, doesn't reach for the 19th Amendment as she looks to make the case, for example, um, for um, uh, Black women as jurors. Um, you know, she just doesn't reach for it. It's just, um, I don't know, it's a, a wet noodle um, for Black women. And, and this piece I have coming out called um, Thick Women um, in the Thin 19th Amendment is really about how the amendment was never intended. Um, Constance Baker Motley, on the other hand, right, um, and here I want to um, uh, recommend um, the brand new biography from uh, Tamiko Brown Nagin, um, Civil Rights Queen, which is a, a life and times biography of Constance Baker Motley, um, just extraordinary. Um, she really is, right, um, directly in, in line, right, in the, in the 21st century moment that we're in. Um, NAACP litigation team member um, turned um, party operative uh, state office holder um, and then um, first black woman um, to be appointed to the federal bench um, by federal bench by Lyndon Johnson. Um, her life story is a kind of arc um, that um, uh, Professor Brown Nagin is now um, offered up to us um, that really illuminates how this story um, changes over time. Um, and I think back to an earlier question um, and anybody who heard um, Judge um, Brown give her remarks, um, she said, I stand on the shoulders of Constance Baker Motley. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm almost quoting her. Um, and, and, and she told me, they, and, and she told me, she told us they share a birthday, which is sort of fun. Um, but it's to say she did that thing, right, that Kamala Harris had done back in August of 2020, which is tell us something about her genealogy. And it, and it is Judge Motley. It's a great question. Thank you. It's lovely to see you. All right, Jordan Booker, Professor. Yeah, uh, of thank you all um, for an excellent panel and excellent set of discussions. Uh, I'm going to try to be cogent with my question, but I'm not sure how successful I'll be. Um, you all threw out a few different um, points of, of this evening have kind of pointed to and, and woven in some of these messages about the ways different figures across multiple, multiple um, decades have 
sort of reached back and recognized, stood on the, on the shoulders of, of giants, and appreciated and, and, and taken insights from like foremothers, from, from predecessors, and so many important drives. You, um, how figures have supported others in the moment, uh, reached out to sisters, reached out to um, others more broadly to support those who are marginalized in multiple ways, who are thinking ahead to uh, the future, to the prospective generations, to the children who are likely to follow, to the successive generations. These ideas of generativity that are widely valued, but can be especially pronounced among um, uh, different Black and African American families and communities. And it, it resonates with me a lot because of some of the other work I've been looking at just by, uh, well, focused ways in my end, but in happenstance in, in regards to some of these, these conversations, looking at young black women who have talked about ongoing goals in ways they spontaneously will mention wanting to support, reach out, improve the opportunities and the, the, the uh, livelihood of successive generations in some similar ways, though, and, and areas that um, can extend beyond policy, beyond um, um, law, um, but still have wide ranging, if things work out, wide ranging Im impacts on successive generations. And there's this common thread and this common uh, aspect of importance. There's something being passed on and maintained and held dear about the importance of connecting and supporting the ongoing generations that is seem to, to especially stand out with many uh, Black women across many points in time in American history. I'm just wondering, kind of as a very general point, um, are there some ways that, and this can be very formally with some of the figures you all have been um, um, thinking of, or a little bit more broadly in different community settings and, and your own experiences in different ways, where you've seen some of that transmission of those values, you've seen some of the uh, sort of processes by which um, you know, supporting, being a central pillar, lending insight, lending advice, maintaining and securing a better future for those uh, to follow, um, where some of those approaches seem to be standing out a little bit, especially thinking of Black women across different points of history where there's some particularly important settings or opportunities where that's being um, either thinking very specifically about the importance of, of uh, improving political and legal equity, or thinking a little bit more broadly, where that seems to be standing out to you. Thanks, Jordan. Um, and to give a little context, Dr. Booker is a professor of psychology and and does work on um, young young black people, um, young people of of, of color, and, and how they cope and. Um, how they how they navigate. So um, that's definitely where I think where where his, his question is coming from. Um, so could be Dr. Jones, Ida, uh, Dr. Irvin. Any any thoughts on on that? Have you seen um, these kinds of transmissions um, that 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 Jordan is 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 thinking about talking about? I can say a little bit, but I hope other folks will will jump in. I, I mean, um, you know, and it's a bit to the the point I made a moment ago, which is um, when we stop looking for black women in those places where I don't know we've been told they should be, um, and we follow them. Um, in my story, I follow them where? I follow them to church. Um, I follow them to school. Um, I follow them to the Y, um, to club meetings, um, like anti-slavery societies and literary societies. Um, that this is very much um, a story that can only be told by um, entering into those spaces and as best we can as historians sort of listen in right to what um, what is being told but so many of those spaces are multi-generational spaces by nearly by definition um, there are also um, mothers and daughters in this book um, and there are women in this book um, like Mary Church Terrell and Francis Ellen Watkins Harper who 
um, quite literally take their daughters on the road um, uh, as they are on the lecture circuit. It's extraordinary. Um, Terrell's daughter is named Phyllis for Phyllis Wheatley. Um, and in the 20th century is on the road with her mother as her mother is stumping for suffrage for um, anti-lynching legislation and more. Um, what an education. Um, I myself, um, uh, in my own way, come out of an HBCU tradition. And so um, I think that um, whether it's um, the multi-generational life of a campus um, or it is um, alumni or founders weekend um, when the generations turn out um, in my own life, I think that has been um, a really um, central, central um, space for um, learning um, a great deal of what I maybe rediscover as a historian and try to write a book about. Um, so I, I don't know, I don't know what other folks, um, you know, the difference, it, it, Dr. Booker, you know, um, and I know you know this, but I'm just going to say this for the benefit of folks, it's worth saying out loud. My provost is a mathematician and a business school guy. And, um, he, I've been doing a project for the university. And so he's gotten kind of an up close personal look at what I do and what we do as historians. And he said to me, you know, it wasn't until I worked closely with you that I learned that um, historians don't get to um, create their own data. You know, <laughs> that you have to go back to the archive is kind of imperfect and um, incomplete as it is. So I say that to say that um, understanding a little bit about, maybe a little bit about your work, um, that there's a lot we don't know and a lot we can't recover as historians, right? And um, and that's why you'll hear me say, I, you know, I, I could travel in time if I could be a fly on the wall um, because um, for reasons structural, um, for reasons interpersonal, um, particularly the intimate facets of Black women's lives are not as apparent to us as sometimes we wish they were, and we are left to imagine and to infer um, in a way that I imagine in your work it's possible to um, literally be a fly on the wall <laughs> and, and, or the equivalent and to, um, and to um, talk with the folks um, who are at the center of your concerns, which is exciting. Um, I think I um, get the distinction of um, wrapping up this uh, meeting. I want to thank um, everyone. I do want to say as a critical family historian, one of the things I have to have is soft ears and I look for data everywhere, which means when people tell you story, your stories, you're listening for those things that you cannot see. And that's where the meat of the story usually is. So um, we just have to teach young people how to look for those things in their ancestors. And it's not what they're saying, it's what they're not saying. Thank you, Dr. Jones for being with us and Dr. Irvin and Dr. Shanikin and Ida um, Campbell Jones and everyone who sewed up tonight to support Dr. Jones. It means a great deal to me. Um, thank you, Manny. It's good to see you. I have and, one more thing, Tracy. Yes. And okay, and Dr. Shonikin is now, she's gonna get to take over signing off now. I'm off the hook. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Tracy. Um, so a, another thanks to our co-sponsors for this event, the College of Education, Social Studies Education, um, The Bridge, and of course, our community partner, Race Matters Friends. Um, I want to draw your attention to our event for next week. We are con continuing on the theme of Black History, of Women's History Month, as we've just come out of Black History Month. Um, I want to um, mention that we have an event next week, 4.30 to 6 o'clock, March 16th. Um, we will have a panel called um, A Place to Call Home. And we're looking at Mizzou and the ways in which Mizzou has been or 
has been challenged um, to be a, a home for all. Um, and this has been inspired by um, Reed Hall and its place on our campus. But we will have uh, Julie Middleton on the panel. We will have Mary, Mary Beth Brown on our panel. We will also have um, representatives from, from the Legion of Black Collegians, um, as well as a, a couple of other really important folks. So please, please come back. That's in person and, and Zoom. Um, so please come back to that. Thanks again, uh, Kiana, Ida, thank you for, for agreeing to, to do this. And Dr. Jones, we cannot thank you enough. And Tracy, thank you for bringing this to our center. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.